All right, good morning, everybody. Hey, welcome to uh, Greenmont. For those of you who are our guests, my name is Seth Hanke, the pastor here, and it's great to have you. We are in the middle of a series in the book of Ephesians. This week, we are in uh, week six, Ephesians chapter three. So get out your Bibles with me if you would. Turn on your phones, and uh, we're gonna get going here this morning. I'm excited to share the word of God with you at and I pray that this would just challenge and encourage us this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about the call of God that's on our lives and why the call is worth the cost. I was reading a quote this week by a pastor theologian, an Anglican pastor and theologian named Ray Ortland, and he said something that just really inspired me, really challenged me, and I wanted to share it at the beginning of this message. He said, don't waste your life in the false peace of worldly comfort and small ambition and being cool, Jesus is looking for gospel hooligans who want to get messy and relevant and involved. He wants to use you for the advance of the gospel. So don't miss out. Don't settle for a life that won't matter forever. Do you want people to say at your funeral, what a nice person, and that's it? Your life can count for many people forever. And all he asks of you, all you can do is keep listening to him moment by moment and then take your next step, whatever that might be. You provide your weakness and need. He provides his strength, his wisdom, everything. And if we will together live that way on mission, we will experience what only God can do. Isn't that an amazing quote Church, we have a unique call. Every one of us here today who is a born-again child of God, we have been given an assignment, a call that has a purpose to it that will infuse us with a sense of meaning for the rest of our lives. And it's a call that matters for eternity. And because of that, it comes with heavenly rewards. But at the end of the day, the cost of that call is what God wants us to remember. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. And if you're here today and you want to give your life as a sacrifice for God's purpose, if you want to be about something bigger than yourself, something that lasts for eternity, and you want to experience God's power at work in you, doing only what he can do through very simple you, then today's message, I believe, is for your heart. It will encourage you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you this morning embolden us to live a life that matters for eternity? Would you awaken us from our slumber would you help us to see the unsearchable riches of Christ and his call that is on our lives? And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Now, as I mentioned, we are in Ephesians chapter 3. And quite honestly, it is an odd passage this morning. This is one of those passages that if you weren't preaching exegetically through the Bible, you would just skip right over the passage and move on to the next one. It's just kind of a strange passage piece of scripture because Paul goes and has this episode. Right in the middle of this passage, he starts talking about one thing, and then all of a sudden, he starts talking about another thing, and I say this is one of Paul's ADD moments. You ever have one of those before, or many of those a day? Scholars refer to it as Paul's autobiographical tangent, which I think sounds a whole lot more sophisticated. But what Paul does here in this passage that we're going to jump into this morning, talking about the call and the cost of the call that God has given us, is that he's going to begin talking about one thing, and then he's going to spend the majority of the time talking about the ministry that God has called him to. We see this even in verse 1 as it starts out this way, for this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentile squirrel. That's what that, that's what that dash is. It's one of these moments where Paul goes off on a tangent. That's literally what that's in the text for. And he begins to jump track and start talking about 
his ministry. And actually, if you cut out verse 1 and you cut out, or you cut out verse 2 through verse 12 in this passage and you sandwich verse 1 and 14 together, it moves together flawlessly, seamlessly. As Paul says these words in verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father. Paul is starting a prayer for the church. Then he had his moment, and then he'll go back to his prayer next week that we'll pick up on for the church in Ephesus. But what he's about to say in the next 13 verses is going to reveal his mindset to us this morning about the call and the cost of ministry. Let's read these verses together. I'll read them for us from the NIV. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I have already written briefly, in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me. To preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This passage that we just read lays out one of the most robust theologies of suffering in the entire New Testament. This is from the mind of a man who was thrown into prison multiple times. He was beaten with 40 lashes. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was assaulted. He went days without meals. He was floating in the ocean. And he said all of those things that happened to him were for the sake of the gospel for the sake of the call that God had placed on his life. And so he tells the church in verse one that we just read, he said, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. And we need to just take a moment and look at where Paul is coming from as he's speaking these words to us this morning because it has direct import to what we're gonna talk about for the rest of the morning. Paul was sitting in a Roman jail writing these words. He was there because of what happened to him in Jerusalem just a short while before when he was at the temple. Reader's Digest version here, you can read the rest of this in Acts chapters 21 and 22, but essentially Paul was with some Gentile friends of his in Jerusalem. And last week we spoke about the dividing wall of hostility. It was a 10-foot wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the temple complex where only the Jews could be in worship. worship. And if a Gentile would cross over that wall, they would do so at the threat of dying, at the threat of death. And so there was Paul in Jerusalem with his Gentile friend Trophimus and some other guys, and they were hanging out. And then all of a sudden, Paul was in the temple area. And the people that were there that were Jewish who saw Paul with his Gentile friends freaked out because they thought that he had brought Gentiles into the temple. They formed a mob, and then they tried to kill Paul. But by some act of God's grace, there were some Roman soldiers there who stepped in and rescued Paul, and they brought him away from the mob. But as you know Paul, Paul wasn't one to run from trouble. So as they were pulling him to safety, Paul said, wait a second, I've got an angry mob of people, some protection, 
why don't I preach? And so that's what Paul did. He went out on the balcony. And to this angry mob of people who wanted to kill him just a few moments earlier, Paul began to preach and teach about how God rescued him and this experience that he had on this road. Uh, And God opened his eyes. And as he got to the end of his message, everyone was listening intently. He had them captured until he said these words, Jesus told me to go and to also minister to the Gentiles. And as soon as Paul uttered those words, people lost their minds. And once again, people flew into a rage and started to shout that he was not fit to live. Long story very short, Paul ends up, because he was a Roman citizen, appealing to the emperor Nero to hear his case. And so he was transported all the way to Rome, where he was in jail, chained to a Roman guard while awaiting his trial. And while he was there, he wrote Ephesians and Colossians. And he was writing to this church and the churches in Asia Minor to encourage them while he was the one who was in jail. Think about that for a second. Paul was in jail, and he was writing to encourage a bunch of free people in the church in Ephesus. And it was all because of the sense of call that Paul had from God for the ministry that he had been given. I don't know about you, but let's get real for a moment and just talk about what we would have been experiencing if we were Paul sitting in a jail, chained to a Roman guard. I don't know about you, but I might be thinking thoughts like, God, why didn't you protect me? I'm a little bit miffed here, Lord. God, I have a right to hold a pity party right here because life isn't fair. I'm not sure, Lord, that I even really want to be a part of this ministry that you have called me to. You can have your ministry back. I mean, come on, church. Let's be real and honest. Most of us don't suffer very often. We were riding down the Virginia Creeper Trail two days ago with the Brennemans. And the beautiful sunny day that we were enjoying turned into an absolute downpour. And our kids were covered in mud from head to toe. And there was nowhere to go to escape. And I remember this is probably the closest to suffering that I've experienced in many, many years. (laughs) But see, this isn't anything at all compared to what Paul was experiencing in his prison cell. But you know what? None of it even mattered to Paul. He didn't even care. Look at what he said again in verse 1. I am the prisoner of Christ Jesus. The prisoner of Christ Jesus. See, by all appearances to everyone who would have looked in on Paul's situation, he was a prisoner of Nero. He was chained to a guard. His life was controlled by the Roman Empire. And yet Paul's like, Forget about it, man. I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm not here because of the Jews. I'm not here because of Nero. I am an apostle. I am a minister, and I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What else can you do to me? What a perspective. What a perspective. I love what this pastor, Daryl Dash, from Toronto, Canada said. He said, understanding the gospel, it gives us confidence and hope in our trials And understanding the gospel allowed Paul to see his life completely differently. The same thing can happen for us where instead of seeing ourselves as a teacher or an entrepreneur or a church planner, fill in the blank. We can see ourselves as servants working for Jesus Christ. And so when we suffer, we can see that even our suffering has a purpose. When we serve God, we can see the ministry as a gift from God rather than an obligation or something that we're just doing for the Lord. And it will give us humility because we'll marvel that God has actually chosen us, even though we are the least of all God's people. Understanding the gospel gives us confidence and hope in our trials. See, that was Paul's mindset. That's why he could say, I am a prisoner of the Lord. And that's why he could say just a few verses later to the Christians who were so worried about him. He said, so I ask you, therefore, brothers and sisters in Ephesus, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Guys, I'm not worried about jail. 
don't worry about me in jail. This is just a time out for me to be able to do some important administrative writing and other things that I need to catch up on. And all of this is for the glory of God. See, this, this thing that Paul just spoke to the Christians in Ephesus, that he's speaking to us, is this bigger idea that we see in Paul's writings. We see it throughout Scripture, and it's this, that suffering precedes glory. Suffering precedes glory. And see, you have to understand that. If you're going to embrace the call that Jesus has extended to you in your life. Paul is suffering, but he's like, guys, you don't get it. My suffering is going to precede glory, and I'm certain of the fact that God's grace is going to help me, even in the experience of all the sufferings that are coming in my life. I remember when my wife, Melissa, was giving birth to our daughter, Stella. And toward the end of the delivery, there were some issues. And suddenly, I remember all of these nurses came rushing into the room with us. And there was a lot of movement, and there seemed to be a lot of concern on the face of the doctor. And what we found out that was that with every contraction, Stella's heartbeat was dropping dangerously low. And so they told Melissa it was time to get on with it, time to soldier up, and, and just she needed to push. She needed to bring Stella into the world or something else would have to happen. And I just remember sitting there looking on helplessly. Any men here? Thank you, women. You're amazing. At the, just the pain and the determination and the suffering in my wife's face. And then just moments later, we were greeted by the beautiful sound of this little baby girl. And they took her and put her on my wife's chest. And I remember with every cry that we heard, we just breathed this deep sigh of relief. And as Melissa held her there in her arms, there was this beautiful, amazing, inexpressible glory that just filled the room. It was it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. And in a moment, all of that suffering had turned into joy. The pain and the sorrow and the anguish gave way to indescribable glory. Why is that? Because in life, suffering precedes glory. And so the Apostle Paul could say, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. For the sake of you Gentiles and my sufferings are for your glory. They're for your glory. And see, Paul would go on to say this in verse 2, and I, have, I know that you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I have already written briefly, and in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And this is the mystery, that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. That's good news, church. That's 2,000 years old, and it may sound like uh, whatever, but it was... So important that the Apostle Paul was willing to count the cost and to give his life for that call to be the one who shared the mystery of Christ with the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul said that he was given the administration of God's grace. In the Greek, that word means oversight or stewardship. He was called to basically, as his job, oversee or steward God's message of reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles in Christ. If you were here last week, we looked at that and how Jews and Gentiles have a new identity and that is in Christ. That's who we are. And Paul goes on to say that when the spiritual realms look on at the church, which is Jew and Gentile, they just sit back and they're amazed. 
I, I can just imagine at creation as God fashioned Adam and then he made Eve that the angels looked on with awe, right? And, and then as, as the, the Son of God, the incarnate one, was born to Mary, that the angels looked on and saw the glory of this little one who would fulfill his father's purpose to bring people back to God. But there was another entirely different kind of glory that the angels were looking on in. They are still looking on as they see this beautiful, profound mystery of Jews and Gentiles united as one in Christ today. Amen? You are a mystery. It is a supernatural reality to not only the unseen realm, but to the seen realm of those around us. When they watch how we love one another, we care for one another, we place Jesus as primary in our lives and in our relationship. And the Apostle Paul said that this mystery, that it was a mystery for thousands of years, but God revealed it to Paul. He didn't reveal it to David or Moses or Elijah, but this was a new revelation from the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. But do you know what? Even though it was revealed to Paul and the apostles and prophets, Jesus and his ministry had even begun laying the groundwork for this. Do you remember the story where Jesus met a Roman centurion and he was blown away by this man's faith? And after he met this Gentile, he said to all those around him in Matthew 8, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west. They will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus speaking about? He's looking forward to the revelation of that mystery that Paul received, that Jew and Gentile would come together as one new man in Christ. We see this in the book of Acts. When Peter got this real up close and personal experience in Acts 10, God gave him a vision and there was a sheet that was let down with all these unclean animals and God's like, go out and eat, Peter. And Peter's like, no, God, I, I don't eat unclean animals. And God said to him, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And what was God doing? He was, he was foreshadowing, he was speaking to Peter about this reality that the Gentiles were going to be included. And then we fast forward to the life of Saul. This guy who was on his way with his own purpose to persecute the church of God, but gets knocked off his horse and he gets blinded. And there's this guy named Ananias who ends up coming and praying for him. And the Lord tells Ananias, he said, you know that guy Saul, who's been killing my people, persecuting them? I want to let you know something. Saul is going to be a chosen instrument of mine to minister to the Gentiles. See, God's heart was bursting to reveal this mystery that Jew and Gentile would become one in the church, that he would show it off to the unseen realms, that they would long to look in on what we have here this morning. The Bible tells us that after Paul had that experience of his conversion, that there was about a three-year break where he escapes into Arabia. And what we think happened as Paul was in Arabia was that Jesus was training him. He was tearing away some of the misunderstandings of Scripture, the lies, the falsehoods. He was instructing him and giving him revelation so that he could understand this new mystery, this new message. And so in Galatians chapter 2 we see that there was this 14-year gap church that takes place. And Paul goes down to Jerusalem and he meets up with all the apostles and he's like, guys, you gotta hear what God's been speaking to me. This is what he told me about Jews and Gentiles. And they listen to him and they're like, oh my goodness, man. You got the real thing. You are a legitimate apostle. And they probably were thinking, we probably shouldn't have gone and laid hands on Matthias so fast. That's a side note. But for 17 years, God took Paul and he gave him this intensive seminary experience where he was showing him the message, the call that he had placed on his life 
to share about the mystery of Christ that had been concealed for thousands of years. And I want to draw your attention to what Paul says about this mystery, church. In verse 6, he said, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ. I like to read different versions of the Bible. The NIV kind of misses it on this part. And I really like the NIV. But Paul makes up his own words. How many of you would love to get to make up your own words? Paul makes up his own words, and he uses these three compound words. He says that they are fellow heirs, they are fellow members, and they are fellow partakers. That's us of the promises of God. He says they're fellow heirs, which speaks of permanence. It's not going to get taken away from them. They're fellow members. That means that there's unity. And then he says that they are fellow partakers. That means there's empowerment by the Holy Spirit for the ministry that God is giving to them. You remember that Peter was blown away because Cornelius and his family, like they were all speaking in tongues and like having church, hallelujah, right? And he's like, oh my goodness, didn't we see this in Jerusalem, right? The day of Pentecost. God's given them the same thing. God's amazing. And he's saying that Gentiles are now one with believing Jews and we are heirs and members and partakers. Paul wants them to know that all of this, this call on his life, this message, this ministry, that he didn't make any of it up, nor did he take any credit for any of it, but it was all God. Listen to what he said in verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Paul was just absolutely convinced that his call, his ministry, everything was from God. Listen to what he said. I became a servant by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of God's power. My opportunity, my message, my empowerment, it's all from God. It's all because of his grace because I don't deserve any of it. If anything, Paul worked against the things of God. He deserved something far worse. See, Paul understood that. That's why he could say, although I'm the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me. He said, I'm the least of all God's people. If you want to know what true spiritual maturity looks like, church, don't look at how flashy it is. Don't look how charismatic a person is or how much they seem to have it all together, look for humility. Look for humility in a person. Do they give praise to God in all circumstances, regardless of what's happening, good and bad, or do they draw attention to themselves? Paul said, I'm the least of all the Lord's people. I'm the leastest. See, he made up a word again. That's what it means in the Greek. I'm the leastest. And this wasn't a new idea for Paul. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, you remember that Paul said, I'm the least of the apostles. He's like, that was in his early letters. Here in Ephesians, he said, I'm the least of all of the believers. In 1 Timothy 1, at the end of his life, he said, I am the chief of all sinners. I am at the bottom. He is at the top. The closer that you are, get to Jesus Christ as a believer. The closer you grow to God, the more aware you will become of your sin, the more aware you will become of your need, the more it will draw you to humility. This is called sanctification. This is the process of God getting greater in us, understanding who we are in light of his amazing glory and goodness in our lives. And Paul says, that it's learned in our lives through suffering. How much have you really learned in your life that really matters that didn't come through difficulty, trial, or suffering? Is there much? Most of the riches and the treasures that you have to share with other people come from a place of suffering or trials in your life. Most of the books that get written get written because of these places where people experience something and God steps in and they say, 
you won't believe what God did in my life. Ten and a half years ago, I became the lead pastor here at Greenmont. Many of you remember those moments. I had lots of amazing ideas. I had lots of passion. And I remember writing down all my goals. We're going to baptize 250 people. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I was doing lots of great things for God. <laughs> That's what I thought. And three years into my ministry as a lead pastor here, I went into a depression. I got discouraged because things weren't happening according to my plans. I had them all written down, too. I can pull them up on a Word document and show them to you. And they were good God plans that I had baptized from some grow conference and some mega church somewhere else that I thought were for Greenmont and for us. And God wants to do this here. And that was my purpose. And I remember one day in my office, I was sitting there and I did what I should have done many years before as I got down on my knees. <laughs> and I gave up on my plans and I gave them all back. And I surrendered. And I said, God, I just want to do what your plan is for Greenmont and for this church. And I want to get out of the way. And do you know what? That's when things started to turn around in me. And that's what's most important. That God had to bring me to that place where I could finally see what it was all about. And that I could see that it was all about him. And Paul never got over that reality. That even though he was incredibly gifted by God, he could probably do incredible things with his degrees, his charisma. That all of it was directly related and correlated to his dependence on Jesus. See, Paul's going to go on in the next chapter in two, but in chapter four and talk about the fact that all of us have been gifted for ministry. You've all received a gifting, a calling, but all of it has to be anchored in your dependence upon Jesus or it will become a hindrance to the things of God. God doesn't need our, our intellect and our wisdom, so a lot of times it gets in the way, right? God is looking for people who are desperate for him, who are hungry, who are in his word, who are seeking after him, who are humble, who give him the glory and the praise in their life, who are willing to talk about even their shortcomings and their failures because they know it's about him. And this is what Paul is saying to us this morning in Ephesians chapter 3. The closer that we grow to Christ, the gauge that we need to continually look at isn't how much we're doing for God, but how much we know God is doing for us. Are we dependent upon him? I need to close this message this morning. And I want to share a story with you as I do. But many of you are perhaps familiar with the name of a man, Richard Wormbrand. He was an evangelical pastor from Romania who began an underground ministry. He spoke out publicly about the evils of communism when the communists seized control of his nation and all of its churches in 1945. And for his offenses, the communists imprisoned and tortured him for 14 years until he was finally released in 1964 for $10,000. He eventually made his way across the pond to the United States. He stood before the Senate where he took off his shirt and showed the deep gashes, 18 of them on his back from the torture that he received through all of his time in the prisons. But while he was here, he and his wife, Sabina, co-founded a ministry called The Voice of the Martyrs, which was to give a voice to the underground church and to call the church to remember those who are suffering in the name of Christ all around the globe. But to the very end of his life, when he could have tapped out when he came to America, because everything was comfortable for him for the first time, he continued to follow the call of God on his life and count the cost. And here's how he did that. When he was in his 70s, one time he was scheduled to speak 
in Berlin, which was a walled off city surrounded by the East German communist military. It was a dangerous place to go, but there was a door that had been opened to him and an opportunity to go and encourage the church. But just before he was to leave America to fly to Germany, he fell in his bathroom at home, he fractured his skull, and he was taken to the hospital. The very next morning, the nurses who were attending him were shocked to find Richard Wormbrand putting on his clothes and getting dressed and trying to leave the hospital. And when they tried to stop him, he looked at them and he said, how can I sit in this bed with only a little pain in my head when I am supposed to speak in Berlin where the people suffer so much more? than I do here. Church, there is a cost to the call that we have been given for the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has called you. He has gifted you in unique ways for his glory, for his purpose. But if we, like the Apostle Paul, don't allow God to, to direct our steps in and through suffering and trials and difficulty. We will not experience the full weight of his glory in and through our lives. It was through Paul's suffering that that God revealed his calling to minister to the Gentiles. And God wants us to take a step with arms open wide to say, we may have these light and momentary afflictions and trials, but he is working a much greater work in and through our lives. And we don't want to miss that opportunity. We want our lives to matter for eternity, don't we, church? Paul said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have made us one in Christ with the Jewish people. We thank you that that mystery was revealed through a man who understood his calling and the cost of that calling. Lord, you have extended to each of us here today a calling And I pray that you would bring clarity to each of us around that, that we would live and exist for that purpose alone and above all others. And Lord, if we're living for other things here, would you wake us up? Would you help us? Help us to understand the glory, God, that you want to reveal in and through our lives as we surrender them to you. I pray for your church today at Greenmont. I thank you for this group of people who want to pour out their lives for the gospel. I thank you for your amazing grace. May we, everywhere we go this week, may we point to Jesus. May we, through humility, be reminded that it's all about him, what he has done, our very breath, the ministry, the life. It's all because of your amazing grace in and through us. And we pray these things in your name. And all God's people said, amen.